If you're tempted by the cheapest 3D printers for yourself or a loved one this Christmas, maybe just hold on a moment, because you may be getting more frustration than fun. Today we explore common issues with budget machines and the fixes to ensure a smooth experience. Hobby 3D printing has thankfully moved on in terms of offering more Just Works machines that more often than not will work as advertised. But there are still plenty of bargain options available, attractive to people who don't know better. So what exactly can you expect from one of these budget machines? Well today, we recover one that according to a new user was no longer working and see what's what. On my website, I've got my review policy that goes through the terms of exactly how any interaction with myself and a company goes. It's pretty clear in stating that the customer comes first and I won't hide any problems with the machines. I'll be showing my experience warts and all. Sometimes however, companies try and get around this or perhaps just force my hand because they want something covered on the channel that isn't particularly interesting to me or the general public. And that's exactly what happened in the past with this Elegoo Neptune 2. It was sent to me without my agreement so it was never featured on the channel. As we can see, this model is officially sold out but there's still plenty of printers just like it on the market that are Ender 3 clones. This is a hangover from a period where 3D printer manufacturers were tripping over themselves to make the cheapest Ender 3 clone possible rather than invest the time and money into actually engineering an innovative product. Furthermore, the original Ender 3 is still for sale and it is pretty cheap. So what can you expect if you're tempted by getting one of these cheaper 3D printers and what are the likely problems that you'll face? Before we move forward, a couple of things. I took the chance to scold Elegoo, so please pause and read if you want to see them grovel. And true to my word, I donated it without ever opening it to my friend Andy, and for a while he said that it did work, but soon he started to talk about models coming loose from the bed or no filament coming out at all. I agreed to take it back and diagnose the problem. And here it is, the Neptune 2 by Elegoo. The reason I would have never agreed to review this is that despite their marketing claims, it's simply an Ender 3 clone. Same hot end, same V-rollers and extrusion, same manual bed leveling, and the same textured bed clipped on with stationary supplies. Oh, and pretty much an exact copy of the first Ender 3 extruders. But I don't want to undersell it because they have added this touchscreen that has a model preview and real-time progress bar. So let's turn this 3D printer on and try and establish what exactly has gone wrong with it. The first thing I noticed is that it took way too long to boot and I've cut down what you're seeing here. But when it did eventually get to the main menu, I figured I would just print something from the SD card and then I'd be able to see exactly what was happening. The only trouble was the printer menu kept on saying no files found. So I removed the SD card and took some files off it in case the firmware was struggling to read through them all and that got me a little bit further, although the machine liked to have errors like you're seeing here. My solution was to add this printer in Orca Slicer, thank you devs and community, and wipe everything from the SD card besides this single G-code file. And that was successful in getting the printer working and allowing me to finally start a print. So what's actually wrong with this thing? It seemed to preheat, home, and then lay down a purge line without any issues. But as you can see, that purge line looks quite squished into the bed, and for the first travel movement from the corner to the center of the bed for the model, we can see the same thing happening too. The nozzle is far too close. I initially looked for some sort of baby stepping menu on the LCD, but there was none to be found. So instead, I utilized a technique that people experienced with 3D printing would do, and that's a live level, adjusting the height of the bed to move it just far enough away from the nozzle that the rest of the first layer could go down properly. And that was all it took for the print to continue without issue. Apart from being pretty slow, the quality looked fine too, so no clogs or other dramas, just a bed that needed leveling. So why hadn't Andy leveled it? Well, remember that he had and it was working, but for one reason or another, the bed had gone out of level, and this is something that catches out many first 3D printer owners if the 3D printer has manual leveling. The good news is the printer wasn't actually broken. However, this is a common problem for new users, and this and other ones are no doubt going to reveal themselves in the future. So what exactly does it take to make this thing future-proof and more user-friendly? Apart from some stringing between the ears, the print finished just fine. And it had a strong grip on the bed too. So rather than risk injury by using a scraper, I chose to remove it the way the manufacturer intended, by unclipping the bulldog clips on each corner 
and then flexing the bed to remove the model. With this much manual handling, it's easy to understand why the leveling knobs might have shifted in their position and changed the level of the bed. So for this particular machine, this method of holding the bed is not exactly ideal, especially when the clips encroach on the usable build area. So the first change I'm going to make is upgrading the bed to an easier system, and fortunately for me, I've got a lot of spares left over. And due to the popularity of the Ender 3, there's plenty of companies making this upgrade. This upgrade bed is designed for an Ender 3, but as you can see, it's exactly the same size, one of the upsides of these clones. Installation is simple and is over in about a minute. We have an adhesive backed magnet and all we have to do is align it and then press it on as we peel back the film. After this we take our choice of spring steel plate and place it on top and it snaps into position. Removing prints in future is now going to be a lot more convenient. It's been years since I reviewed a printer without a magnetic spring steel bed so this upgrade brings it up to modern standards. We need to undo a couple of bolts to get to the next component that I'm going to upgrade which is the factory hot end, and the reason I'm changing this is because it's PTF lined and not all metal. Apart from the Elegoo logo on the silicon sock, it looks to be an exact Ender 3 clone, so that means we have options. Let's compare it to what's going in instead, a Micro Swiss all metal hot end. There are cheaper options available, but this one has been going strong for many years now, and in my experience, fitting one of these means doing it once and doing it right. As you can see, dimensionally they're pretty much identical, apart from one key area, and that's the inlet for the PTFE tube. On the Micro Swiss hot end, it only plugs in around 10mm or so, meaning all of the components down near where the filaments actually melted are, as the name suggests, all metal. On the stock hot end, the PTFE tube runs the whole way down into the melt zone. Here in this diagram, we can see it highlighted in green. The trouble comes over time, whether through deterioration or just from wiggling out of position, the tube is no longer seated against the back of the nozzle. That leaves a void that the hot filament can melt and expand into, jamming everything up. And for a new user, this will be frustrating because it's completely invisible from the outside. The printer will just stop printing. So for long-term reliability and with that peace of mind, for me it makes sense to change to one of these all model hot ends, especially considering they're a straight swap. All you do is unbolt the old one, bolt in the new one and reinstall the electronics without rewiring anything. Even the factory silicon sock fits right back on. Another weak link is the factory plastic extruder, and this is cloned off the early versions of the Ender 3 that had a few problems. Firstly, that entry point is all plastic and the filament wears it down as it goes through. And more significantly, these arms were prone to breaking from the stresses over time, and if you didn't spot it, you're going to be scratching your head wondering what was happening to your print quality. So again, in the interest of improving reliability and performance, we're going to fit a bolt-on upgrade. And I've chosen something proven that I've fitted to many 3D printers now, the Easy Astruder by CME CNC. Fundamentally, it works the same. It has a sprung bearing that pushes against the filament to help it grip, but this one's more robust and I've never had it fail. Furthermore, the filament path is a lot more constrained, making it better for printing flexibles. The same goes for the hobbed gear, which has a cutout to better suit the shape of the filament compared to the flat original item. And finally, we get the added convenience of a knob that goes on top to manually advance or retract the filament. Fitment is really simple. We simply unbolt the old one and bolt on the new one in its place. Four M3 bolts enter from the top through the printer's bracket and into the stepper motor. Then the hobbed gear slides down from the top with a piece of filament inserted to get it to sit at the right height before we lock the grub screw against the flat side of the stepper motor output and push on the manual twisting knob. The existing PTFE tube slides back in a lot further than the old one did and that, combined with the knob, makes filament feeding and unfeeding a lot simpler. Technically an E-steps calibration is needed any time you change the extruder. I've got a free guide to this on my calibration website and typically the value for one of these EZR extruders comes out around 95. All of this is very well and good but there's one main problem remaining and that's the manual bed leveling. So why not eliminate this process and make the printer a lot more reliable? To do that, we're going to fit a BL Touch by Ant Clabs, another upgrade I've done many times and trust greatly. And don't forget that for any installation, you'll need an extension cable too. I found a free mount ready to go by Myco Cub that worked a treat. To install it, we use two M3 by 6mm bolts and insert them with the bracket onto the existing threaded holes on the carriage. Before we go any further, we need to feed that extension cable through from the print head back to the main board. And this is the worst job in this whole video. It starts off really easy, 
but it's not long before the plug-in cable needs some persuasion to pass them through. But eventually you should get there, you can now plug in the BL Touch and use the hardware that came with it to bolt it to the printed mount. This mount, by the way, positioned the probe at an ideal height just above the nozzle when stowed. We can reapply those zip ties and turn our attention to the other end, plugging in the cable to our mainboard. I found this Elegoo page when trying to find out information about firmware and mainboard pins. And surprise surprise, a lot of the links were simply dead. But one did go through to this GitHub repo from Naruto FZR that had some very valuable information. I used the wiring diagram here to plug in two of the wires in place of the ZN stock and the other three to the labelled BL touch port. Excess extension wire was cable tied and pushed behind the blower fan. According to this document, you can use a text file on the SD card to somehow convert the firmware to support auto bed leveling. I honestly didn't trust that system, so I thought I would install Vanilla Marlin using a community config set of files for the Neptune 2. Confession, it's been quite a long time since I last compiled Marlin. So to assist myself, I used my own guide available on my website that not that many people know about. The format there with the annotated pictures aims to make it as simple as possible to recreate the steps in VS Code when preparing the firmware. The only deviation was taking the probe offsets from those provided on the printables page for the mount. I powered up the printer and verified that the firmware had updated successfully. Let's take a chance to thank the Marlin devs and all of the community who contribute to the project. Not only was the firmware updated and supporting a BL touch, but the whole touchscreen interface was updated too, recreating what you would normally find on a normal Marlin LCD. So bye bye to that buggy interface that couldn't find the files on the SD card and when it did, decided to crash and be full of bugs. Now we have a proper menu for BL Touch functions, including Marlin Z Offset Probe Wizard. In case you are new to 3D printing, what we've done here is added auto bed leveling. At the start of each print, the BL Touch will probe the surface of the bed, mapping its topology, and as the first layer goes down, it will be matched to any uneven contours and perfectly set the correct distance from the nozzle. And that means consistent first layers, regardless of if the bed moves, and that equates to much more reliable and hassle-free 3D printing. Let me be clear in the point of this video. Cheap 3D printers are cheap for a reason. Instead of being high quality, their components are designed to be cheap to manufacture. And we have addressed that with the upgrades in this video, but in doing so, we have effectively doubled the purchase price of the printer. And in my opinion, unless you're looking to tinker, you're better off getting something like a Bamboo Lab A1 Mini, which is still my recommendation as the best beginner 3D printer. So if you or perhaps someone you know is looking to get into the hobby this Christmas, maybe send them to this video so they can be properly warned. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.